All right, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Thank you all for coming. We are very excited for the last event that we have this semester. Uh, as a lot of you assuredly know, we've had a very successful semester. We've been privileged to hear from a lot of great speakers who have come from across the country to deliver their data to us, to talk to us about the things that are happening uh, around the country in libertarian and conservative thought. And we're very pleased uh, for the time that they've taken and uh, very grateful for that. Uh, today we are particularly blessed to hear from uh, Justice Thomas R. Lee of the Utah Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Lee, after graduating from University of Chicago Law School, uh, clerked with Justice Thomas on the, on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and has since joined the Utah Supreme Court and is one of the pioneers in corpus linguistics and the use of data in um, determining the actual meaning of statutes and the Constitution. And we are going to hear about how that works and just what Corpus Linguistics is tonight. We're very pleased to hear from him. Uh, so without further ado, uh, everyone join me in a round of applause for Justice Lee. Thank you, Josh. Um, thanks. And thanks to the Federal Society for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. I've kind of been taking this show on the road for the last few years since I became interested in trying to measure the meaning of language of statutes and now the Constitution. I've spoken at probably a dozen or so law schools um, throughout the country and I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to talk to, to a BYU audience about it um, today. I was, I was thinking sort of, of, of how, to, how to introduce this. I um, was having a conversation at the dinner table recently with my three-year-old granddaughter and she asked me um, what job I did and um, I think this was spurred by the fact that her dad my son-in-law is a medical student and so she'd been having this conversation with her dad um, and uh, it turns out that's pretty hard to compete with because um, my you know my granddaughter's uh, conversation with her dad was you know her dad saves people, you know, from dying and helps them when they're sick. And so what do you do, Papa? That's what she calls me. And man, it was, it was a hard question to answer. I, I think I, I tried something like, you know, well, I'm a lawyer and, you know, lawyers help people to be free and stuff. And she's kind of like, yeah, her eyes are kind of glazing over at me and don't know what that really means. And well, we help people, people so they don't have to go to jail and Kind of that worked maybe a little bit better, but it, it just really wasn't. I wasn't selling what she was buying. It wasn't going over really well. I, and it occurred to me if I told her what I really did, uh, if you ask my kids what I do for a living, I, I, I have two kids left at home, 16-year-old twins. I think what they'd tell you that I do for a living is I stare at a computer screen and I write stuff and I read stuff for a living. It's pretty much what, what a lot of lawyers do is they read and you know they write for a living. Actually, I can't think of a whole lot more interesting of a job to do than to be able to argue and read and write about things that really matter and affect people's lives. But if I, if I had been completely 100% honest with my granddaughter, probably what I ha would have told her about what I do for a living is that I'm an interpreter. Um, I, I resolve ambiguities in language. And this is true for most appellate judges. You know, trial court judges have a whole lot of other things that they do, but um, if you're an appellate judge, that's kind of your job. You, you, the, the reason why cases that, that raise legal problems come up, especially to a court of last resort, like, like my court, is that the law is unclear. And usually when the law is unclear, it's that the language of the law has an ambiguity in it, some vagueness in it that has to be resolved. That's why a few years ago, the faculty, I think, wisely here at the law school decided that legislation needed to be a first-year law course because so much of what happens with respect to the way that the law evolves and develops is that, you know, the, the, our human language is imperfect, our ability to anticipate unforeseen applications of the language that we put into the law, that, that's imperfect, and so we need judges to 
sort of sort all that out. And, and that's, that's kind of what this project is about and what, this, um, what, the, what I want to talk to you today is about. It's about how judges go about resolving ambiguities in language or how we ought to be doing it, maybe. Um, I want to talk specifically about our interpretation of, I think, the most important overarching law that we have, the Constitution. And I want to speak specifically to a theory of interpretation called originalism. My thesis is two, twofold. One, that originalism is the worst of all possible means of interpreting the Constitution, except for all the others. <laughs> and second, that our current methods of originalism aren't quite living up to the premises of this theory of interpretation. Let me state these points a little more forcefully. First, I want to tell you why I think originalism is the only defensible way of interpreting the Constitution. Then I want to highlight some shortcomings of the way that we're engaging in originalism and show you how we can do it better using a database and a linguistic tool that's being developed here at BYU. Uh, before we dive into the premises of constitutional interpretation, I think it might be useful to start by considering other forms of language. Um, because the, the, the ambiguities that lawyers and judges face in terms of legal language, it's not just legal language that requires interpretation. There are all, all sorts of other language where we run into ambiguities and we as human beings figure out how to resolve those ambiguities. And I think it's useful to start by comparing the language of the Constitution to the language of, of other forms of communication. Um, and I, I think we can identify some differences in different types of language and learn something from those differences. I think the differences can be illuminating and I think um, can, can help us understand part of the basis for understanding uh, the premises of originalism. This is what I want to start with. I, I want you to think about a non-legal document. This is a letter that was written in the 12th century. And our 12th century letter is a letter that makes reference to a deer. The question I want you to think about is how you would go about interpreting, understanding that reference to a deer. Here are two, here are two possible interpretations of a deer. A deer might be any animal belonging to the family cervidae. That's the fancy Latin term for the family that includes you know, what we normally think of as a deer today. The second possible definition is a broader one referring to any four-legged animal. So you're reading this 12th century letter, you're trying to understand what the author of the letter is describing as you're reading that letter. Let me give you some additional information as you're thinking about how you would understand this letter. Um, as Professor Larry Solom has indicated, I stole this idea, or this example rather, from Larry Solom, who's a, a professor at, at Georgetown. Deer is a term that has undergone something called linguistic drift. Linguistic drift is, is a term that linguists have come up with that just describes the idea that our language changes and adapts. And you all have already seen language adaptation and change when you've been around a lot longer like I have. You've seen even more language drift um, over time. I'll give you a couple of other examples um, when we get there in a minute. And, and language drift in particular is um, on display here. Deer has undergone linguistic drift. In the 12th century, it meant any four-legged animal. Today, of course, we understand it differently. A, a specific kind of a animal, a specific mammal uh, belonging to a specific family, you know, the cervidae family that, that refers to any of a number of species of deer. So, so now, the, now that you understand that, my, my question is, now that you know that our 21st century understanding of deer is different from the 12th century understanding of deer. The question is, if you're trying to understand this letter, which definition of deer are you going to apply? How many of you think that, that you're going to go with the second definition of deer on that slide? Anybody, anybody think that you ought to go with the modern understanding? If, you're, if your true goal is to understand the intentions, the impressions, the understanding of the person who wrote that letter, 
I would submit that the only right answer is, now that you've understood linguistic drift, the second of those two definitions. Um, Solom, Larry Solom sort of backs this up, and he says that any earnest attempt to discern the meaning of the letter would necessarily go with the sense fixed in the 12th century. It would be a linguistic mistake, he says, to conclude that the 12th century reference to deer was necessarily a reference to a cervidae animal. And I, I think that's just impossible to quarrel with. Where word meaning is clear, and where our only uh, goal is to decipher its communicative content at the time it was transmitted, I think everybody would deem the original meaning to be fixed and to be constraining. These are two premises of originalist theory that I'll come back to in, in more detail in a minute. Let me, let me just define fixation and constraint here. The fixation as I, idea is that the meaning of language is understood to be fixed at the time it is used. If our language drifts over time, we ignore the drift and stick with the fixed meaning, at least if what we're trying to do is to understand the meaning at the time of the original document. That says that the animal referred to in the 12th century letter is fixed by the broad four-legged animal notion. Constraint is a related point. It says that we're constrained by or limited to the original meaning if we're trying to abide by the meaning. So if we're following originalist principles, we're constrained by the four-legged animal notion of deer. We'd be making a linguistic mistake, as Solom puts it, if we assume the modern notion of deer, a notion limited to the cervidae family. So th that certainly holds in the, the context into the meaning of a letter. Question I want to now start thinking about with you is whether it's any different if what we're talking about is legal language. Let me give you a let me give you a couple of examples um, here. Um, as you think about, instead of a letter, what if we're talking about a modern statute or an 18th century constitution? Let me, let me have you think about a different term. This is another term that has undergone linguistic drift. If I say the phrase domestic violence, which of those two definitions do you all think of? It's the first one, right? If you used that phrase in the 18th century, in the century in which the Constitution was uh, ratified and adopted, it would be the second understanding of domestic violence. I can explain to you how I know that in a, in a few minutes. You, you can get all kinds of corpus data that will tell you the answer to this question. But this is another prime example of linguistic drift. We, um, in the 21st century, used the term domestic violence in a completely different way from the way that it was used um, in, the, in the 18th century. Now, the question is um, whether we ought to be any less committed to the premises of fixation and constraint with respect to legal language than we should with respect to that letter I was describing to you uh, a minute ago. Let me ask you to think about a, a statute, a 21st century statute. You've got a criminal client who has come to you. He has just um, pleaded guilty to uh, sexual assault on a member of his household. And um, he has come across a statute that's been on the books since the 18th century that makes it an act of treason, punishable by death, to engage in an act of domestic violence. And he wants you to defend him. What do you think? Are you more committed or less committed to an originalist understanding of language when it comes to legal language as opposed to that letter. You're smiling, right? Does anybody think that your client is subject to, to being prosecuted for treason? No. I mean, that's, that's got to be way more troubling. I mean, if, if we care about fixed language in terms of trying to understand that 12th century letter, we ought to be way more committed to those principles when it comes to the law. Why? Well, just way more rides on the law, right? I mean, people's freedom, people's lives, you know, their livelihood. So many things ride on our understanding of the law. And, and if what we're trying to do is to understand the meaning of the law, we ought to follow its original meaning and not today's sort of modern understanding of its meaning. This, this is so the, the reasons for it are, we'll get into this in some detail in a second when I sort of present the premises of originalism for you, but you know, 
we care about the intent of the lawmaker. What was the intent of the lawmaker? I was talking about an 18th century statute. Were they thinking about domestic violence in the 21st century sense when they adopted that statute? No. They were thinking about insurrection or rebellion. Um, another reason why we care about fixation with respect to legal language is, you know, think about the um, reliance interests and the, the unfair surprise meted out on your client who just pleaded guilty to a count of domestic violence. Could he ever expect that he was guilty of treason? No. That's not the way that we think about um, treason. It's not the way that we, you know, the 18th century notion of domestic violence is, is, uh, causes all sorts of problems in terms of unfair surprise. What about, what about with respect to the Constitution? How is the Constitution different from even from statutes. Let me ask for a couple of ideas. So I just said that statutes are different from the letter in the sense that there are, there are more important consequences that flow from a correct understanding of the law than from just understanding the letter. But constitutions are even a little bit different from statutes. Alex? Constitution is a founding document that set up our government. Okay. Right. So if we're willing to change the structure for how we change the law, then that opens up a whole world of possibilities. Yeah, it, it's a basic foundational constitutive document. Constitutive in the sense that it, it establishes the premises for our government. Um, this is an argument that would say, I'll elaborate more on this in just a second, but this is an argument that would say we ought to be even more concerned about protecting the fixed, historically understood meaning of this document um, than with respect to any other. What other differences are there? There's at least one difference that people sometimes cite against originalism and, and sort of in favor of a more living constitutionalist approach to interpreting the Constitution. Anybody think of another difference between the Constitution and a statute? Yes, sir. Right. They were living then. Right. So that changes maybe the opinion about how you feel the law to be applied. Yeah. So I mean that's true of my of my statute example though, right? Uh, you know, domestic violence means something very different today than it did in the 18th century, and yet we're really uncomfortable charging someone with the 21st century understanding of domestic violence and and being subject to treason. What else? And this may be along the same strain, but so the statute is enacted today. So we can say that we enacted the statute with the understanding of the circumstances around us, whereas if we interpreted the Constitution based on uh, 18th century, then they didn't understand what was going on in today's world. Right. I'll come back to that in a minute. Let me, let me hit a couple of other differences. Uh, the Constitution was made to last for a long time without being changed. Just made to the 21st yeah, I, I think that's, that's close to the point that I'm thinking of. It's not a wrong point, but let me elaborate on that point just a little bit. The, the argument that people often make is the point that you're making about this was a document intended to stand the test of time, but also that it speaks in sort of broad, um, sweeping, sort of magisterial terms. And, that, that, you know, and, and it did so for a reason. You know, because the document was supposed to stand the test of time. So think about these two differences as I talk to you about some of the premises for originalism and some of the criticisms of originalism and the arguments in favor of or, or, or against it. Um, so these are sort of the two basic ways that we think about interpreting the Constitution. Um, in a sense, these are not... Um, well, let me, let me leave that part out. I want to make sure we're, we just got started a little late, so I may, I may skip over some of this in, in an attempt to try to get to my main points and leave a little bit of time for discussion. So the first thing I want to do with respect to originalism is present to you two different notions of originalism. They are related. Originalism is sort of a family of doctrines that, that stand for premises of fixation and constraint. Um, within that family of doctrines, you have a notion called original intent originalism. But my WWJMT is what, what would James Madison think? Um, 
So this is, in a sense, this is old school originalism. This is your father's originalism. Well, no, for me, it's probably for you, it's your grandfather's originalism. It's my father's originalism. This is like 1970s style originalism and, and before. And it, the question that it's asking is, what would the, the framers, you know, what would the people who um, drafted and ratified the Constitution have thought about a particular constitutional problem? Where do you go to answer that kind of a question? You go to the Federalist Papers, you go to the records of the convention, you go to journals and letters of the framers. Um, most people today think of originalism in slightly different terms, and it's, it's referred to as original public meaning originalism. The idea of original public meaning originalism is we're not so much concerned with what James Madison would have thought about a particular problem. We're concerned with how would the general public in the 18th century have understood the language adopted in the Constitution? What legal principle would they understood to have been embedded in the Constitution? That's a much broader inquiry. And when you're thinking about original public meaning, you think about instead of just getting into the mind of James Madison by looking at the Federalist Papers, you want to know, you want to look at any and all writings revealing language usage, the usage of the day. Uh, and you're trying to understand the operative legal principle, not necessarily the application of that legal principle. Let me give you a quick example here. Um, sometimes originalism gets criticized on the grounds that we are asking an incoherent question. There's a case called uh, United States versus Kylo. Kylo is a Fourth Amendment case. And in the Kylo case, the question was, is the use of infrared technology to try to detect somebody growing a marijuana plant behind the walls of their home, is that a search for purposes of the Fourth Amendment? If you think about the originalist inquiry in the sort of original intent sort of form, your question might take the form of, what would James Madison have thought about infrared technology? Nothing. He couldn't possibly have thought anything about infrared technology because it didn't exist and it was a long ways from existing. He didn't think about it. So sometimes people say, therefore, originalism is bunk. It asks incoherent, you know, nonsense questions. Well, the, the original public meaning originalism is sort of aimed at trying to reorient our inquiry and make it make more sense. And it makes more sense when you ask the question not what would the framing generation have thought about infrared technology, but how would they have understood the notion of a protection against unreasonable search and seizure? In particular, what would they, how would they have defined the notion of a search? Right? And the majority opinion, Justice Scalia wrote a majority opinion in the Kylo case, and it's, a, it's an originalist opinion that stakes out the position that the elements of a search were A, B, and C. You know, essentially, are you using some sort of methodology that allows you to get information about what's inside of somebody's home, what's inside of their dwelling, that you couldn't get without uh, getting a warrant? Uh, and, and so if you think about the principle in that way, not the application, but the principle, that's sort of the idea of original public meaning um, originalism. I want to talk to you about two example cases and build in a minute to sort of explain to you how I think we're a little bit falling short on the way we're handling the original public meaning inquiry and how we can do it a little bit better. The two examples are United States versus Lopez and Kilo versus City of New London. I, I suspect these are familiar cases for at least those of you who are in your second and third year. If you've had con law, I suspect you've talked about um, these two cases. The, question in the Lopez case is the constitutionality of the Gun-Free School Zones Act. The Gun-Free School Zones Act was a federal statute that made it a crime to possess a firearm within, I don't know, what was it, a thousand feet or something like that of a school. And it was challenged on Commerce Clause grounds. The, the argument was um, our federal government has limited power, limited enumerated powers. Article 1, Section 8 gives the federal government the power to regulate interstate commerce. What does it mean to regulate interstate commerce? And the argument was possessing a firearm within a certain number of feet of a school, that has nothing to do with commerce. I'll come back to this in a minute um, and, and give you a little more detail. The Kelo case is a takings case. This is a Fifth Amendment case. And the Fifth Amendment says that private property shall not be taken for public use 
without just compensation. In the Kelo case, the city had taken, essentially had taken property from one owner and transferred it to another to further economic development. And the argument was, hey, that doesn't qualify under the public use element of the takings clause. Not only do you have a right to just compensation, but you have a right not to have your property taken unless it's for a public use. Again, more, more on the detail um, here in a minute. Um, I think I can hit these next two slides fairly quickly, but to sort of complete the, the sort of uh, background of the case for um, originalism, I, I need to sort of make some of the arguments against it. The critiques of originalism, this is sort of the case for living constitutionalism, sort of builds on the idea that we were talking about earlier. Not only is this a document aimed to sort of stand the test of time, but it's a document that has vagueness built into it, ambiguity built into it, maybe intentionally. We've got these sort of broad terms uh, that are indeterminate. Uh, a second argument, which is related to that, is we can't really find a whole lot of clear answers in history. Historical originalist analysis is hard. It's difficult to find clear answers in, in the history, you know, about what is a search, or what does it mean to be a public use, or what does it mean to regulate interstate commerce. And the, the, the final argument is, is, is a sort of more broad sweeping one. It's, it's sort of the, the dead hand argument. It's we don't want to be controlled by, um, you know, sort of racist white guys um, who don't understand our society today. Uh, and that's unfair and originalist principles are, are unfair. So there's probably more to it than that, but I think those are the essential arguments. Let me, let me respond to each of them briefly. Um, the indeterminacy problem, or, or think of it as underdeterminacy, a vagueness sort of problem, is a fair point as far as it goes. But in a sense, this is inherent in any law that is written down. This is a problem inherent in, you know, think back on our 12th century letter. Think back on our statute, you know, criminalizing um, uh, or, or making it an act of treason to engage in, in an act of domestic violence, you know, any of those sorts of, of problems. Language is always at least sometimes indeterminate or underdeterminate. Um, this is really a critique of written law. And the end point of this sort of an argument would basically be to say written law never means anything, or at least since we can't tell exactly what it means, it should mean whatever we want it to mean today. That ought to be a dangerous proposition, having just sort of walked through the problems associated with not taking language seriously with respect to our example statutes or provisions of the Constitution. But moreover, the whole point of having a written Constitution this is sort of part of what Alex was getting at in his comment. The whole point of having a written constitution was to set down some basic fundamental principles um, that were supposed to stand the test of time, not by evolving and adapting, not by judges being able to say, yeah, that Fourth Amendment stuff about protecting our privacy, protecting our security in our homes, yeah, we don't really care so much about that anymore today, and we're more concerned about pr pr preserving our our security protecting our society from terrorism or something like that, so we're gonna throw all that away. Clearly that wasn't the point of the Constitution. The point was to write it down and to have it be fixed. Another way to think about this is, yeah, there are some clauses of the Constitution that have vagueness in them, but there are many others that are really clear. And the principle of originalism at a minimum stands for the proposition that where we can find clear answers for all the reasons I've been talking about, we ought to follow them. Uh, the historical inquiry point is a, is a fair one. Sometimes it's really hard to figure out what the historical understanding of a provision of the Constitution is. Sometimes this argument sort of takes the form of, you know, look, um, we think historical analysis gives way too much discretion to judges. It isn't sufficiently limiting or sufficiently determinate. Let me say this in response to that argument. If that's your concern, well, you better run 100 miles an hour away from living constitutionalism because living constitutionalism has that problem in spades, right? If what you're concerned about is this isn't going to limit the discretion of a judge interpreting the Constitution, well, then the worst possible thing you could do is to tell a judge, Constitution isn't fixed. It means whatever you want it to mean today. 
or it means whatever you can persuade if you're a US Supreme Court justice, whatever you can persuade four of your other, of your other colleagues um, you know, that it ought to mean today. Um, my friend Larry Solomon that I, that I referred to earlier gave some what I thought was really powerful testimony along these lines in the Gorsuch hearings. Um, and if, if you're interested, you ought to go and look up Larry Solomon's Gorsuch testimony. It's really powerful. Let me, let me give you the 30 second version of what he had to say. Larry Solom is a political liberal. That was the first thing he said. I'm not conservative. I don't vote Republican. But I am a committed originalist. And he said uh, to, to the speaking specifically to the Democrat members of the Senate and the Senate Judiciary Committee, you all are really missing something here. You're getting all worked up over uh, Neil Gorsuch's commitment to principles of originalism. And, and, and the point he made was this. Think about it in this way. If what you're concerned about is somebody who's going to take their conservatism and run with it, what you ought to really be concerned about is somebody who's not committed to originalism, who won't come in here and say, look, I don't treat the Constitution as a charter for me to vindicate whatever, vindicate whatever political principles I find to be best. I think of the Constitution instead as being fixed in time. This is, this is a very limiting principle. It, 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 and again, if what you're concerned about is indeterminacy or difficulty, well, then, then, then you, ought to, um, you, know, you ought to love originalism and be really concerned about living constitutionalism. That last point, I sort of have no response to it other than, again, to remind us this is the point of having a constitution. If you want to fight another revolution, and find another constitution, then go for it. But the revolution that we fought, and the constitution that we fought for, and the one that we adopted, and the one that has protected us and preserved us, and allowed this society that we live in, the greatest society in the history of planet Earth, in my view, is because we haven't let a principle like that last one sort of blow the whole system up. It will blow the whole system up if we ignore what the Constitution was supposed to be about. And we ought to be really concerned about that kind of an argument. Do I think the document's perfect? Absolutely not. Do I think it could be improved? Yeah, I do. But um, to, to sort of take the idea that it has some imperfections in it and to say, therefore, it means nothing or it means only what we want it to say politically, uh, you know, that, that's anarchy and, and deeply problematic. I'm going to skip that slide and, and uh, see if I can, in the next five minutes where I hit, hit the guts of the thesis. So this is where I want to say what we're doing in terms of our approach to originalism. I've sort of given you the premises for why I think we need to try to find original meaning. What I want to present to you for a minute is why I think we're not quite delivering on the premises of originalism, why we're not doing it as well as we could do it. Let me talk to you about um, let me go back to the Lopez case and the Kilo case here and, and give you a couple of examples of how we generally approach problems of original meaning of the Constitution. Um, Justice Thomas's opinion um, in the Lopez case, among other things, in trying to find the original meaning of the Commerce Clause, uh, looks up the term commerce in a founding era dictionary. I think some combination of Samuel Johnson's dictionary and Noah Webster's dictionary both of them 18th century dictionaries or early 19th century dictionaries trying to find historical understanding of what we meant by the term commerce. There's a problem with that approach to trying to find the meaning of the Constitution, however. Um, and, and it is that dictionaries don't tend to give you, um, well, let me, let me, let me try it this way with this, with this slide. There, there are, there's a series of problems with dictionaries. One, um, dictionaries like the Noah Webster dictionary, uh, in a sense, is not old enough because it is a dictionary that is um, drawing upon, uh, to some degree, uh, it was published after the fact. It was published in the, 18th, in the 19th century rather than in the 18th century. There's a sense in which it's too old. Many of the examples of usage that find their way into definitions in the Noah Webster Dictionary, they come from Shakespeare. They come from the Bible. 
Um, they're not really telling you how language is used in the 18th century. Uh, it's not sufficiently American. If what we're trying to find is American language understanding in the 18th century, most of the Webster's Dictionary is borrowing from British sources. Um, we're also omitting linguistic context. If what we're really trying to understand is not just the term commerce, but what it means for a government to regulate interstate commerce, you can't really get that out of a dictionary. You've got to have sort of broader um, linguistic context to understand the language of the Constitution. And, and lastly, and this is a problem that occurs with respect to all kinds of dictionary usage and statutory interpretation, for example, usually what you'll find when you try to look up a word in a dictionary is that you'll find both sides have a dictionary definition that will support their approach to the problem um, that you're presented with. I'll, I'll elaborate on this in a second. And so what Justice Thomas is doing in the Lopez opinion is a start. And the dictionary definitions of commerce that he finds um, in that opinion give you some sense of historical usage and historical understanding. But really, they're sort of a cherry picking problem. And there's a not quite enough linguistic context sort of a problem. This really isn't um, careful originalist analysis. Uh, and, and I say that in all humility because I worked on that opinion. I clerked for Justice Thomas in 1994, and I was one of his law clerks who worked on that opinion. So, and, and, and I'm not trying, so I'm not trying to single out Justice Thomas. In fact, I think Justice Thomas's opinions are as careful an originalism as you'll find in any judicial opinions. But historically, this is the way we've been doing originalism. And I think we can do better for reasons we'll, we'll talk about. Um, the other way that you see judges historically approaching originalism is to find sample sentences of usage from um, uh, brochures or pamphlets or books. Um, so in the Kelo case, for example, um, there are, there's a majority opinion. There's also a dissenting opinion from Justice Thomas in the Kelo opinion. The dissenting opinion from Justice Thomas in the Kelo opinion says, um, well, we got to figure out what public use means. There's, another, there's a reason why in Kelo you don't go to the dictionary. Why Justice Thomas, instead of going to the dictionary, he finds sample sentences from books and brochures. And it is, you can look up public in the dictionary. You can look up use in the dictionary. But what we really need to understand is what does public use as a phrase mean, right? I mean, linguists will tell you that phrases often mean something different than the sum of their parts. You, you can't just look up two words and piece the two definitions together. So you really need to know what that phrase means. So this is a good step in the right direction in the Kelo opinion. Go find sample sentences from books and pamphlets. But again, I think it's still not quite enough because there, there's a sense of, of a cherry picking problem at work here. If the, let me phrase it in this way. If the original public meaning question is an empirical question, if what we're asking is how was language generally used in the 18th century, it just doesn't do to sort of say, hey, I found three or four sample sentences probably even more than three or four in, in the Kelo opinion, if, if I recall. But even if, it's, even if it's eight or 10, here are some sample sentences where people were talking about public use in the way that I find uh, you know, persuasive. That just won't do. Um, if you're trying to answer an empirical question, you've you got to have data. All right. Now I've left myself exactly about five minutes to give you the real sort of guts of what I want to present to you, which, which isn't enough. Um, but but um, here's where corpus linguistics comes into play. Um, corpus linguistics is uh, a corpus is a body, so cor a body of language. So here we're talking about not just a single book or an isolated pamphlet. We're talking about a database of as many books and pamphlets and writings as you could find from the 18th century. So corpus linguistics is the study of language or language usage using uh, trying to get data from large bodies of language um, in the relevant time period. Um, here at BYU, they, they are developing um, a founding era corpus called COFIA, the Corpus of Founding Era American English. And it compiles a bunch of different stuff. I've got some of them listed here. 
what, what I'm proposing and what I'm suggesting is if you want to understand public use, if you want to understand commerce, the thing to do is to go and not pick out a couple of isolated sentences that you may happen to have find, but run a big database search on this database with millions of different sentences and millions of words um, in the database. Find every time that someone in the founding era was talking about public use. Find every time in the founding era that someone was talking about regulating interstate commerce. And um, then what you'll get is a bunch of concordance lines. And then you can click on those concordance lines and you can read them. And in context, you can try to understand. You won't always be able to tell, but often you can tell in context um, what, uh, what they were talking about. And I, I'm just going to wind up in the next couple of minutes to try to leave it at least um, four or five minutes for your comments or your questions. But I had started to try to, I'm working on another law review article, and I, I've started to try to do some measuring in terms of uh, what was the ordinary understanding of commerce at the time of the, of the framing of the Constitution. These are sort of listed here in this bar chart, sort of a range of different ways of understanding commerce. Justice Thomas's idea in, uh, in his separate opinion in the Lopez case was it seemed to have in mind not just sort of the broad idea of any gainful activity, but the idea of selling and buying um, and bartering. And at least on a first cut through, we're still working on the data. Uh, it seems like he was right. And it seems like, um, not only does it seem like his, he's right because I've got dictionary definitions, but you can find lots and lots of instances in which people are talking about commerce, and they, they overwhelmingly seem to be talking about uh, the, the limited notion of commerce that Justice Thomas has in mind. You, you can find something similar, uh, perhaps not um, quite as overwhelming with respect to public use. The basic question in the, in the Kelo case had to do with whether public use means the public actually employing um, the property. So public use in the sense of the government takes your house because it wants to build a road so that the public can um, occupy the land that it's taking. That's sort of the limited narrow notion that Justice Thomas has in mind that the dissenters were arguing for in the Kelo case. Or is it enough that there was just some general public purpose Right? The public purpose in Kelo, the argument was, well, we're taking Josh's land to give it to Alex because we think Alex is going to use it more economically efficiently. Alex is shaking his head yes. And that will benefit the public. And if it benefits the public because our economy is going to be stimulated, well, then that's a public use. And here again, the data, we, we need to do some more with it. But um, the preliminary indication is that uh, the public purpose notion is only very rare. The public employ idea seems to be the predominant understanding. So l let me just make one sort of quick comment by way of, of conclusion here. I, I think that there are some problems, there are some unanswered problems in terms of methodology, in terms of how we ought to go about compiling this data, what to make of the data when we run into problems of ambiguity. I think we're still working through, we're at very early stages of trying to figure out how to use data to drive um, originalism. Gathering, coding, and analyzing data is a whole lot harder than just opening up a dusty old dictionary or cherry picking a favorite sentence or two from a founding era document. For these and other reasons, I expect people are going to push back on this. Uh, people are not going to like this. People are going to find problems with it. But I'm convinced that this is the direction we need to go to make originalism more transparent, more reliable, and, and more consistent with its underlying premises. So I, I think data-backed originalism is going to be harder. But this is a constitution we're expounding. It's a document that has protected our freedoms and preserved the integrity of our society for the most part for well over 200 years. It's worthy of respect of the respect reinfused in it by the practice of originalism, and it's worth every effort that's required of those who remain committed to its fundamental original premises, which I am and I hope you will be. Thank you.
So do we have time to try to take a couple of questions? Yeah, or? I've got a couple okay. of questions. I can either call from the audience or you can find either way. Um, I, I'm, I'll be happy to. Go ahead. Uh, so you shared with us how corpus linguistics is used to analyze the meaning of a couple of phrases. I'd love to hear more about how you envision the practical application of corpus linguistics and the website uh, going forward. Yeah, so fortunately, we probably don't have time to get into that in, in great detail. The, the basic idea of corpus analysis is you find uh, a keyword in context. You're finding concordance lines in you know, a broad range of language. It might be books. It might be pamphlets. Um, you're finding not just individual words and looking up definitions. You're finding broader phrases. And then you read maybe a full, you can click on the concordance lines as they come up, and you read the sort of broader sentence or paragraph that it appears in. And then you're saying, Look, when they're talking about public use, they seem to have in mind this particular kind of public use or that particular kind of public use. Then you're sort of coding or tabulating data. So you're going to go through, you know, let, let's say you get 800 hits, 800 concordance lines on public use. Maybe if you've got uh, research assistants that are going to help you or I have law clerks who work for me, I can say go read all those 800 lines or go through them. Statistically, another way to do it would be sort of randomize the 800 hits and I'm going to look at 100 of them and then I'm going to tabulate them and add them up. In some cases, I think you're going to, you're, you're going to um, sort of hit gold and you're going to find, well, 96% of the time, you know, it's the kind of public use that Justice Thomas is talking about or it's 96% of the time the other way. If that happens, then I, I feel like the data sort of answers the question that's presented for you. Unfortunately, in other cases, and I've come up against this on when I've tried to apply this in problems of statutory interpretation, unfortunately, sometimes what you get is it's more 50-50 or 60-40. That's a much harder problem. Then what do you do with that problem? One basic answer to that question is, well, at least you know that um, it's a hard question to answer from the standpoint of what's the ordinary understanding of the language. And then maybe what you do is you fall back on something else. You fall back on... Uh, the, the rule of lenity. You know, you fall back on a, a substantive canon of construction. You fall back on, you go to the legislative history or you find some other basis for resolving the problem of interpretation that you're presented. So even in circumstances where the data aren't conclusive, I think they're still helpful because they tell you where to turn next to resolve the problem of interpretation. I wish we had more time and I can show you more. I could show you more about how it works. It's not hard to do. It's sort of, it's, it's kind of like doing a Westlaw search or a Nexus search in Lexis. If, if you're sort of, sort of ever gone into LexisNexis and looked at their Nexus database of, of, uh, of like, uh, you know, magazine and newspaper articles, you can also do, I've done sort of corpus analysis, what I've called sort of dumbed down corpus analysis. You can, you can do a Google News search. You go to Google News and just look at newspaper articles in a certain period of time. You can sort of do a, a, a corpus analysis in that way. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Um, are you planning on doing any projects with this, like uh, in the summer? Yes. Yeah, I'm working on an article right now. I have a co-author, which is a, a former law clerk of mine. And um, we are always looking for people who want to help with the project. So come, if any of you are interested, come and let me know and talk to me. Alex? Sorry? Yeah, so um, I assume, I don't know this for sure, but I assume that next fall the deans may ask me to teach a law and corpus linguistics class, which I've taught in the past. And, um, and it's a class where we'll, you know, we'll get into these nuts and bolts in a lot of detail and sort of talk about, th this can be applied in contract interpretation as well. Do the one else have contracts this semester or is that next semester? So, I mean, these problems of ambiguity come up in contract interpretation all the time. Um, so, uh, yeah, plug for that class. And this semester I'm teaching a class on the, it's called the theory and practice of interpretation. It's not really a corpus linguistics class, but it's about sort of comparing the enterprise of 
statutory and constitutional and contract interpretation, and a little bit about you know how to use this tool, but but not in a lot of great detail. One one last question. I think you had your hand up. You um, still have one. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask if like this is gets harder when you start like trying to compare it to, to maybe like new technology like computers or uh, artificial intelligence or things like that. But it sounds like when you get hard, it's just more like you could be able to. There are some like parallels you can draw. To, like you were thinking of how advanced the technology is, or how different our world is from from when the bodies of writing that you're studying were. But yeah, yeah. I think there are a bunch of unanswered questions and problems. I mean, this this is um, this is a new frontier, and um, you know, I, I I think I have sort of some gut reactions to some you know sort of basic sense of what I would do if faced with some of the indeterminacy of the data. You know, what if the data is sort of more mixed? Um, but there are a lot of brighter people than I am that, that know a whole lot more about linguistics and corpus linguistics than I do. I, you know, I, I suspect, my, my sense is that in your lifetimes in the law, this will be the sort of tool where we'll, we'll have some settled, established sort of best practices. Here's how you're supposed to approach this problem. Here's where you can get data that's useful to answering problems of ambiguity. Here's where the data won't really give you an answer. Um, here are circumstances, by the way, where instead of just looking for corpus data, you ought to set up a survey. This is something we're talking about in my, in my class right now. You know, that there, are, there are ways of just surveying the general public. You know, what do you think is the ordinary understanding of this term or this phrase when it comes to language of a contract or language of a statute or something like that? So maybe I'm wrong, and you know, may, maybe this will be just a little flash where the Folks at BYU got really excited about something, and then it turned into not much of anything. But you know, the the first article that I wrote on this got picked up by a pretty good law journal, and so I you know I happen to think that it is going to catch on, and that in in your lifetime in the law there there will be more to it than that. And I think your generation of lawyers is the generation of lawyers that will do it. When I talk to older lawyers about this, their eyes glaze over. In fact, my colleagues, not that they're old, but. <laughs> My, my track record on the Utah Supreme Court, I have written three or four opinions proposing the use of corpus linguistics in statutory analysis. Want to know how many of my colleagues have joined my opinions? Zero. Um, that's actually not completely true. I wrote, I wrote one opinion where instead of doing fancy, sophisticated corpus analysis, I did a Google News search. And I put it in a footnote at the end of the opinion, and everybody joined it. So <laughs> the, the real part, the real story to tell is if you do dumbed down corpus analysis and you put it in a footnote, everybody's happy with it. But if you do something that seems a little more fancy and sophisticated, then people don't like it. But I think people are starting to come around. The Michigan Supreme Court, all seven members of the Michigan Supreme Court in a case that was handed down a couple of years ago, used corpus data to answer a problem of statutory interpretation in Michigan. And what I started to say a minute ago, I'll just finish that sentence and, and, and then close, is when I talk to older people, it's like, eh, you know, that's complicated, that's weird. When I talk to law students and younger lawyers, it's like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you do it that way? Um, this is now, I think this will come much more naturally to you all. You, you all have never known, at least the younger folks in the room, have never known a, 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 an existence in which you didn't have a massively um, powerful computer in your pocket with you at all times. So the, the, the use of a search engine to try to get data uh, you know, with a computer, I think, will come naturally to you. And I, I think that's where we're headed. I, I hope so. And I, I, I think it's an exciting time to, to be thinking about these problems. So thanks for letting me be here. It's good to be here.